Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, and welcome to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that the Missouri Compromise of 1820 maintained the balance of free and slave states, but more or less kicked the can further down the road when it came to addressing what was really important, the institution of slavery? And that James Monroe's second term as president saw the political unity he had built backfire on him a bit as members of his own cabinet began to position themselves against each other, undermining Monroe's effectiveness as chief executive. And that while Monroe's second term as president was a far cry from his first, he went out with a bang by issuing the Monroe Doctrine, giving hope and confidence to the American public while establishing the U.S. as a world power. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 113, The Missouri Compromise and Monroe's Second Term. All right, everyone, welcome into episode 113. Um, right off the bat, I do want to acknowledge that uh, if you noticed in the <clears throat> tease and the title of the episode, we are not getting to the corrupt bargain of 1824 today. Um, I had prepared, I thought we were going to get to it, but this is what happens when you do the research and recording week by week. You have an idea of getting to more things in the following episode than you uh, actually can because as I, as I dive into the research, I just find more and more fascinating stuff that I think you uh, will maybe want to know or need to know or should know to better understand our history and the context surrounding what's going on. And that means that future events are pushed to future episodes. So uh, if you've been waiting for the discussion on the election of 1824 and the corrupt bargain between Adams and Jackson um, and Henry Clay and all that good stuff, it's a lot of political intrigue and um, it, it's a great story. Uh, that will be next week, and that will basically be the primary topic of conversation in episode 114. Last week, we went into detail about General Andrew Jackson's expedition into Florida. We spoke about a bit of the context surrounding the Florida Territory, the circumstances during and following the War of 1812, and the impact that General Jackson's actions had on our foreign policy. The Seminole War is a pretty fascinating event in our history, and there is, there is a lot more to it than what we were able to cover in episode 112. So if you are interested, I would encourage you to uh, look more into it to learn more. After we wrapped up Jackson's expedition to Florida, we talked about the reaction to it. Monroe was very pleased with Jackson's actions and was excited about the possibility it created for the United States. He knew it was going to be a really good opportunity to leverage Spain and continue to grow the U.S. territory. But not everyone was as pleased as Monroe. As I mentioned, Henry Clay led a small yet loud contingent of congressmen who were taken aback by Jackson's actions and believed that his foray into Spanish land was unconstitutional, for the power to declare war was a congressional power, not an executive power. And oh, by the way, General Jackson was actually neither of those. While some in Washington, D.C. continued to debate over how to process Jackson's victory and ensure that something like that was not to happen in that fashion again, the Panic of 19 only created more stress, anxiety, and division amongst the nation. Early in 1819, when cotton prices in England dropped, a ripple effect began to take place across the country. The state banks that had overextended themselves in the West and the South were stuck. 
when the Bank of the United States decided not to continue its somewhat irresponsible practices, because the Bank of the United States was not without reproach here, the state banks were stuck and many collapsed under the weight of their own irresponsibility. This led to the foreclosure and sale of people's homes and land, creating resentment for the Bank of the United States and the coastal elites, quote-unquote, that many believed it represented and supported. What we will continue to see as we move the narrative forward in today's episode is this division between the New England area and some areas in the South and West begin to form once again, most notably actually uh, around the topic of slavery, North versus South. With many Americans living such drastically different lives and lifestyles than others, it was difficult for the federal government at this point in time to strike a balance and find a way to govern both effectively and admirably. So without further ado, let's jump into episode 113 and see how all this drama continued to play out. What we'll come to find in American history as we continue to study it together, uh, and you likely already know this, but there is no issue that divided our nation more strongly or passionately than that of the institution of slavery. There certainly were cultural and economic frustrations and fights over political ideology that caused resentment, anger, jealousy, and bitterness between warring political factions. But the emotional charge that ignited the passion for politicians and citizens alike when it came to the issue of slavery greatly dwarfed any other issue. As we move forward, you will hopefully begin to better understand just how critical of an issue it was in the United States for the entire 40-year period between now and the outbreak of the Civil War. It had massive impacts on the social, economic, and political fabric of our growing nation, and every time it came up in conversation on the national level, people were ready to throw down. Of course, so much so that it led to the bloodiest war in American history, the Civil War. But up until 1819, slavery was not as divisive as it will later become. And there were a couple of reasons why. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and the Southeast Ordinance of 1780 had clearly set the boundaries for where slavery would be allowed. Because of the climate and soil conditions, slave-based agriculture was permitted south of the Ohio River, whereas any federal territory north of the river would be free. And for the most part, while some people on both sides of those agreements weren't happy about it, these compromises didn't cause too many issues on the national stage. But when these federal laws were passed, no one could foresee just how big of a deal cotton production was going to become in the United States and how much people were going to rely upon and profit off of the expansion of slavery. With Britain's textile industry creating an explosive demand for American cotton. This demand was going to both force and support the immediate and significant expansion of slavery in the U.S. And slaveholders and the slave-dominated states were going to be relying more and more heavily on the profits brought in through this cotton trade and the institution of slavery, you know, of course, in effect, was becoming increasingly vital to the survival of the way of life of different people in the South. And this is one thing that's important to recognize because obviously the institution of slavery is horrific and wrong, and we'll talk a lot more about that in the episodes to come. But one thing I'd like you to really think about as we look at how divisive it was is that many of these Southerners that clung on to it so much, what they were trying to cling on to was the way of life they had adapted to and the way the what they knew and um, their place in society. And they knew that emancipating the slaves or breaking up slavery or changing the dynamic was going to immediately impact them in some type of negative way. Um, and when I would always, when I would think about it like that and we would have those discussions in class, it, it allowed us to change our perspective a bit um, and uh, be, I guess just try to see th- see things through the eyes of of the people that lived at the time, and it, it's really hard to do. And um, of course, it's not explaining away or justifying anything because, if if you don't know already, I've said a hundred times how awful slavery is and and how it's the biggest black eye in American history. But anyway, 
that's I'm not even sure where I was going with that. I felt like it needed to be fed, and it's something that we'll talk about more and more as, as we continue forward. The tension around the issue of slavery uh, increased dramatically when Missouri, a territory that was part of the Louisiana Purchase, fell under the political control of slaveholders. Up to this point in U.S. history, there had been a long simmering resentment for many in the North regarding the spread of slavery and the fact that the South, most notably the state of Virginia, had dominated national politics so much. So when the issue of potential slavery in Missouri popped up, Northern Republican politicians were having none of it. So it, it, let's rewind about a year, actually not even that, just a few months, December of 1819. Both Alabama and Illinois were added as states to the Union. Now, with these two additions, the number of northern and southern representatives in the U.S. Senate was still equal. The number of free states and slave states was still equal. And as you know, there are two representatives in the Senate per state, thus representation in the Senate was equal. But this actually worked out better for the northern free states because the vice president was often from the north. And he, technically, was the tie-breaking vote. Now, while there's equal vote in the Senate, that was not how it was in the House of Republicans at this time, because the northern the population in these northern free states was growing at such a rapid pace compared to the South. Since the representatives in the House are based off of population, it makes sense why the northern states have far more representatives than the southern states did, and the count at this point was approximately 105 votes to 81. With such a disparity in the House of Representatives, the southern states saw a golden opportunity to gain an upper hand in the Senate to balance out their disadvantage in the House that they really could do nothing about, with the admission of Missouri as a slave state. While Alabama and Illinois were officially being admitted to the United States, rumors of an upcoming Missouri admission began to swirl. In order to prevent the North from losing too much leverage in the eventual admission of Missouri, a representative from New York, James Talmadge, proposed an amendment that would ban future slave imports and roll out a program for eventual emancipation emancipation as preconditions for the admission of the state of Missouri. This, of course, would be allowing Missouri to throw the representation in the Senate in favor of the slave states in the short term, but would eventually eliminate the issue altogether through emancipation in the long term. While it passed in the House, pretty predictably, it then also predictably failed in the Senate. The debates over this amendment became really heated, with voting falling exactly between free and slave states. It actually got so intense that many southern slave states threatened secession from the United States if it were to pass. And some could see this type of drama coming from a mile away. John Quincy Adams observed that, quote, a motion for excluding slavery from it has set the two sides of the house, slaveholders and non-slaveholders, into a violent flame against each other. I take it for granted that the present question is a mere preamble, a title page to a great tragic volume. The president thinks this question will be winked away by a compromise, but not I. Much am I mistaken if it is not destined to survive his political and individual life and mine. But John Quincy probably wasn't being fair to President Monroe. He was absolutely aware of how big of a deal this was, and he was incredibly nervous about the outcome, writing in a letter to Thomas Jefferson that, quote, I have never known a question so menacing to the tranquility and even the continuance of our union. All other subjects have given way to it. For obvious reasons, Monroe wanted to ensure his administration did not have a dog in the fight. Being a slave owner himself and having men who were proponents and opponents of slavery in his own cabinet, he required them to stay out of it and to leave it up to the legislative branch to work out. But while Congress was trying their best to ignore the elephant in the room that the growing number of slaves in our nation could pose a problem or the over-reliance on the institution itself was immoral and unstable, citizens of the United States were not sitting idly by like their congressmen. In 1817, afraid of the growing number of African slaves and the potential of a slave rebellion threatening their land and lives, some citizens came up with the plan to resettle black Africans back in Africa. 
In 1817, afraid of the growing number of African slaves and the potential of a slave rebellion threatening their land and lives, some came up with the plan to resettle these black African slaves who had come to America back in Africa. Slaveholding plantation owners joined with citizens to create the American Colonization Society. This was meant to purchase and emancipate slaves and transport them to Africa. Now, most Southerners were in favor of keeping the more docile slaves and only wanted to ship out the more rebellious or provocative ones. Others, though, wanted to emancipate all of the slaves and send them back. Monroe's administration thought this was a pretty good idea and actually funded the effort with $100,000 from the government. So members of the American Colonization Society set out on a mission to return African slaves that were captured from slave traders back to their native lands. After negotiations with local chiefs on the coast of West Africa, the society eventually were able to achieve, at least partly, their objective. They settled land in present-day Liberia in 1821. They began to settle emancipated slaves here and named the area Monrovia after James Monroe. This, by the way, is still the capital city of Liberia today. So it was becoming very apparent to a lot of people that the booming textile industry in Britain that was underwriting the massive cotton expansion in the U.S., was creating an increased reliance on slavery. And, like those of the American Colonization Society, it was likely only going to make things more difficult. With tensions at an all-time high, Speaker of the House Henry Clay stepped in to engineer a compromise to end the stalemate. In 1820, after months of negotiating, Clay introduced a deal that would allow Missouri to be admitted as a slave state, even though the assumption all along was the land in this area would not become a slave territory. But of course, there was a catch. In order to keep the balance of slave states and free states equal in the Senate, Maine, which at this point was part of Massachusetts, would be introduced as a free state. In addition to this, Congress agreed to draw an imaginary line along the latitudinal line of 3630, dividing the remainder of the Louisiana Territory between land that was open to slavery and land that, well, wasn't. This border was the southern border of Missouri and clearly provided a lot more land to the north than it did to the south. Pretty much the only land available to the south of the line was present-day Oklahoma and Arkansas, which at the time was named the Arkansas Territory. I'll be putting up a map when I post this episode so you can see more clearly where this line ran. And of course, the purpose of this line was so they didn't have these controversies in the future. This all almost fell apart when Missouri submitted its state's constitution and barred any free African Americans from moving into Missouri. This clearly and undeniably was a violation of the Constitution, denying free African Americans their right to move freely from one state to another. But for the sake of maintaining compromise, Congress allowed it, with the addition of a couple phrases to blunt its impact, which were political in nature and didn't really change anything. And really, I mean, when you take a step back from that, this reinforced, and I'm laughing, but it's not funny at all, this reinforced just how plainly even many anti-slavery white Americans viewed African Americans, even the free ones, as second-class citizens not worthy of constitutional protections, not if it's politically inconvenient. With that potential unraveling avoided, even in a pretty shameful way, Missouri and Maine were officially admitted to the Union. And while the Southern slaveholders gained a win in the short term, it was clear that this issue was not going to go away. As you can see, if you look on a map, uh, the map that I'm posting, the North has a lot more available land on the northern side of the 3630 line. With the economy booming in the North, cities growing, and the population increasing, the North now represented about 60% of the House of Representatives, and that number was only going to continue to increase in the future. On top of this, because there was so much more land available north of the 3630 line, border, there was a pretty good chance more northern states would be created than those in the south, shifting the balance to the north in the Senate, too. And look, these realities were not lost on anyone, both in the north and the south. 
And the more that slavery became rooted in Southern society and the more that the Southern economy and way of life of its people depended on it as an established social and economic institution, the more emotional people will become when whispers of emancipation begin to once again become common. With the compromise passed in March of 1820, Thomas Jefferson, following along from his home in Monticello, knew that this was not a long-term solution to the problem and that these sectional divisions would only get worse before they ever got better. Noting that, quote, this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I consider it at once the knell of the union. It is hushed indeed for the moment. But this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. The Missouri Compromise had extended this era of good feelings politically in the United States for a little while longer. But in Monroe's second term, this political unity finally unraveled. Following the negotiations over Missouri and the stress and angst that came with it, Monroe, departing that same month in March of 1820, finally wrapped up his nationwide tour by visiting the six remaining southern states he had not been able to visit yet. If you remember, we mentioned last episode that he was taken from his southern touring when word of Henry Clay's admonishment of Jackson became public, and he had to go back and defend his general. The election of 1820 made President Monroe a two-term president, just like the other three Virginians who ran before him. While the tariff of 1816 was a bit controversial, the Panic of 1819 created difficult financial and personal situations for many, and the Missouri Compromise of 1820 stoked the flames of division, Monroe was still overwhelmingly popular, and probably more important, there was no real organization to oppose him. For all intents and purposes, the Federalist Party was dead. The upcoming election of 1820 may have been the least exciting election in American history, at least up to this point. Monroe had firm control over the Democratic-Republican Party, and at this point, that's all that really mattered. He ran unopposed and received 231 of the 235 electoral votes that were available— Three of those four votes that didn't vote for him were abstentions, and the one vote that didn't vote for him uh, voted for John Quincy Adams. And you may be wondering, if Monroe ran unopposed, why the hell did someone vote for John Quincy Adams? He wasn't even running for president. Now, no one is totally sure, but it's believed that this elector voted for John Quincy Adams simply so President Monroe did not get a unanimous vote leaving George Washington as the only unanimous president in American history still today. Monroe's second inaugural was far less exciting than his first. Rain forced a ceremony inside the newly built House of Representatives chamber. The place was packed, and everyone was talking over each other, something that didn't stop Monroe, that didn't stop when Monroe began to speak. Monroe kept having to increase the volume of his voice, but... It seemed as though no one was listening to him. But even though few likely heard him speak the words over their own private conversations, the second inaugural address of Monroe was pretty important nonetheless. Monroe, riding the wave of the most lopsided presidential election in American history, if you can call it a, like, contest, no one ran against him, uh... He was proud of the unity in the nation that he had helped foster and went as far as to predict it would be permanent. Boy, was he wrong. Things would get worse for Monroe in his second term, and it did not take long for him to see the writing on the wall. In case you have forgotten, Monroe's Secretary of Treasury for his entire eight-year term was William H. Crawford. Crawford was a man whom Monroe had known for what seemed to be forever, and at the time he fully trusted him. Because of this, it was a shock to Monroe when he was informed by Crawford Crawford, that the um, $7 million surplus in the Treasury, well, it's actually a $5 million deficit. Oops. Congress, in response to this news, cut back on many of Monroe's plans, especially with regards to upgrading the nation's military fortifications. It also put Monroe in a really awkward position because with these new cutbacks, Monroe was only able to have one major general in the army. 
and someone have more seniority than the incredibly famous Andrew Jackson. So Jackson was on the outs. Monroe had a choice, either ask Jackson to, you know, de- give up his commission or publicly demote him. Neither one seemed like a great option. Knowing this would be a PR disaster for Monroe, he instead was able to avoid the issue altogether by offering Jackson the title of governor of West and East Florida. Jackson, understanding what was going on, happily accepted such a title. While Monroe was humiliated by this accounting error, he had trusted it was an honest mistake, with no malice or poor intent. But Monroe was wrong. Crawford knew what he was doing in miscalculating the numbers and purposefully did it to sandbag Monroe and, as I'll explain in a minute, John C. Calhoun, in an attempt to insert himself as the favored candidate for the upcoming election of 1824. So even though he was handcuffing Monroe for his entire second term, Crawford had determined selfishly that it was worth it. And this is the irony with the consolidation of the Democratic-Republican Party. Monroe had worked so hard to ensure that the nation was united and partisanship eliminated. He was overjoyed at the death of the Federalist Party and hopeful about a one-party America. The problem with this situation, though, was without a watchdog party or really a party system at all, each man with dreams of a political career wasn't beholden to any party structure or system. They were all out on their own, acting solely in their personal best interest with no broader political intent in mind. So in Monroe's second term, he had members of his own cabinet like John Quincy Adams and William H. Crawford competing with each other to get the inside track on the election of 1824, and he was not able to do anything about it. Politically, with no party structure in place and no repercussions for their actions, Monroe had become politically impotent. So, these men started angling against each other, each forming their own political lanes with their followers and advocates falling in line and appealing to the broader public based on social, economic, political, and regional differences. John Quincy observed this happening in real time and was rightfully concerned with its implications, explaining that, quote, as the old line of demarcation between parties has been broken down, personal has taken the place of principled opposition. The personal friends of the president are neither so numerous nor so active nor so able as his opponents. In short, as the first presidential term of Mr. Monroe's administration has hitherto been the period of the greatest national tranquility enjoyed by this nation, at any portion of its history, so it appears to me scarcely avoidable that the second term will be among the most stormy and violent. I told him that I thought the difficulties before him were thickening and becoming hourly more and more formidable. And with this in mind, Crawford's actions with regards to the debt miscalculation now seem to make a lot more sense. Crawford thought that one of his greatest threats in the election of 1824 would actually be John C. Calhoun, and his hope was that this money mismanagement would be laid at Calhoun's feet since he was the Secretary of War. And the War Department, it could now be argued, was the one spending a lot more money than it should have been. And once again, John Quincy Adams saw right through this charade, writing that, quote, Crawford's friends, instead of befriending the administration, operate as powerfully as they can against it. Every act and thought of Crawford looked to the next presidency. All his springs of action work not upon the present, but upon the future. With this political tension rising in his own cabinet, Monroe made what seems like the convenient decision. Try to ignore it. With Monroe refusing to take a role in the conflict, he was, in essence, giving up his own political authority. And this is where politics gets increasingly difficult. For Monroe at this time especially. Because by taking no role in the current political turmoil, Monroe was removing himself from any role in future political positioning, making it almost impossible for him to get his ideas pushed through Congress. There was no political reward for supporting President Monroe at this point, at least uh, with regards to re-election, and no political consequence for refusing. It's like every man for himself. In 1821, Monroe was tired of haggling with Congress and 
failing at every turn, so he took matters into his own hands, expanding our military with an expansion of the U.S. Navy. Monroe annexed, unconstitutionally might I add, a small seal-rich island in the Pacific, and then turned his attention north. Because Russia had recently laid claim to the land all along the western coast of present-day Canada, as close as 150 miles within the U.S. border, the present U.S. border. But Monroe was having none of it. He told John Quincy Adams to tell them that they either renege on their land claims or they will have to fight it out with the U.S. And with that, Russia backed off. The following March, Monroe continued to act to keep Europe out of the Western Hemisphere. He asked Congress to formally recognize the independence of various Latin American nations that had freed themselves from Spanish rule. From Monroe's perspective, there were a few things at play. These nations, through their actions, deserve to be recognized by other nations. And it was an opportunity for the U.S. to act in the interest of liberty and freedom. And it was in the U.S.'s best interest. So with this, Colombia and Mexico were recognized by the U.S. as independent nations. It was at this point that the creation of the Monroe Doctrine began forming. The tensions once again on the rise in Europe, Britain was threatening to go to war to prevent France from trying to regain control over land in South America. Britain asked Monroe to pledge to join them, but like Washington before him, Monroe said, um, no. The U.S. would take care of their own business and protect their interest above all else and not be dragged into someone else's war. Recognizing that there wasn't a clear understanding of what America's role on the global stage consisted of, Monroe wanted to make a statement, clearing it all up for everyone. So Monroe looked to his cabinet for recommendations. And when he did issue this doctrine, as I outlined in in episode 111, it stated that the Western Hemisphere and the American continents were closed off to future colonization or recolonization from the European powers. Now, there's a popular rumor with historians that John Quincy Adams was actually the one who wrote the Monroe Doctrine, but I think it's pretty important to get out there, as Harlow Giles Unger, in his book on Monroe titled The Last Founding Father, explains that John Quincy Adams was not the author of the Monroe Doctrine. It just wasn't. And he even walks through how the recommendations that John Quincy Adams gave to Monroe and how much different they are than the actual doctrine itself. It was Monroe. And, and Unger states, and I'll take it right from his book, that, quote, the assertion that Adams authored the Monroe Doctrine is not only untrue, it borders on the ludicrous. By implying that President Monroe was little more than a puppet manipulated by another's hand. Such assertions show little insight into the presidency itself and the type of man who aspires to and assumes that office. Indeed, those that make these claims denigrate the character, intellect, the intensity, and the sense of power that drive American presidents. And Unger's adamant defense of Monroe would make sense. Monroe had incredible experience in foreign relations with eight years in Paris, London, and Madrid. Additionally, knowing his personality, there's just no way he's going to sit back and let someone else do his job for him. He knew how to govern, and he boldly and confidently decided policies throughout his governorship of Virginia and his, seven, up to this point, seven years as president. In 1823, as Congress gathered to hear Monroe give his annual address, they knew they were witnessing history, the last of the founding father generation on his last legs. Monroe reviewed the incredible success of his presidency and his pride in his current situation. And then he explained that in order to maintain that, they would need to set boundaries and expectations with regards to foreign affairs. It was with this that Monroe detailed what has become known as the Monroe Doctrine, putting a final stamp on his presidential legacy. And Monroe's speech was a home run. Americans absolutely loved it, and they were proud of Monroe for establishing American independence and confidence on the world stage. One legislator exclaimed to the president, quote, Sir, you have made me prouder of my country than ever I was before. I never witnessed the publication of any state paper that was attended with so universal and so enthusiastic an expression of approbation and applause. 
The Monroe Doctrine was a reminder to Europe that it was going to be a lot easier to just trade with the United States than it would be to attack them. Additionally, it eliminated some of the American fears of imminent European invasions, giving renewed energy and confidence to the American public. After all he had done for the nation, it felt right for Monroe to wrap up his decades of public service with this triumph. Next week, we will close the book on Monroe's presidency as we look forward to the election of 1824, the renewal of the two-party system, and the grueling political battle between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, known as the Corrupt Bargain. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. <laughs>